everything we hold of value on Earth, metals, minerals, energy, water, real estate, are literally in near infinite quantities in space. Planetary Resources' mission is to gain access to the natural resources of space by mining near-Earth approaching asteroids. With technological advances that are coming out of exponential technologies and investors willing to bear the risk, small teams are now able to do what only governments and large corporations could do before. Our vision is to catalyze humanity's growth both on and off the Earth. We're breaking new ground. Now is the time for us to gain access to these resources. And at the end, the entire human race will be the beneficiary as we expand our reach beyond the Earth into the solar system. We've been searching for near-Earth objects mainly to assess the hazard of an impact on the Earth. It turns out that most of these asteroids are not a threat to the Earth, but they do offer potential benefits. They're in Earth-like orbits that offer accessible resources that we can tap into, both for scientific knowledge and returning those strategic supplies to Earth. Our plan for opening up the resources of the solar system is threefold. First, we're going to identify all of the most valuable near-Earth asteroids, where they are, what they're made of, and how to reach them. Second, we're going to develop the technology and the capability to transform those resources into valuable materials. And third, we're going to deliver those materials to the point of need, whether it's a fuel depot orbiting the Earth or elsewhere in space. Our small and focused team will enable the commercial exploration of the solar system. We're using experts who gain their experience in NASA and the tech industry, and we're keeping our goals simple and clear. We have a need now for the knowledge of what's on these asteroids. There are potential resources in space, and the government is taking a scientific and measured approach to exploring them. We can really increase the knowledge that we get and the pace at which it comes back to us by involving commercial innovation and commercial visits to these asteroids. We are going to change the way the world thinks about natural resources. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. And launch of the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket as NASA turns to the private sector to resupply the International Space Station. That's not even counting the cost of designing and building the shuttle, it's just 
the cost to run one shuttle mission and to get that much material up there. Um, SpaceX, in contrast, is delivering stuff into orbit, just commercially, even including their own profit, for $4,106. No almost five-fold reduction already. Um, it looks like they're actually going to achieve their goal when their Falcon Heavy booster comes online um, at the end of next year. This booster is actually going to launch into orbit more cargo, more than double the amount of cargo that the shuttle carried. Um, so basically, the single biggest factor that's been making doing things in space expensive and difficult is just going to sort of go away as SpaceX continues launching rockets and making money. Um, to do a sort of analogy of what this means for business and exploration in space, imagine in the U.S. economy if all of a sudden gas went from like $3.70 per gallon to like $0.37 cents per gallon. It's kind of a big deal. Um, so, it just so happens that there's a company that seems to have been waiting for exactly this sort of opportunity, introducing Bigelow Aerospace. Well, officials of NASA will be in southern Nevada tomorrow for an announcement that could make international news. They'll be at the North Las Vegas plant of Bigelow Aerospace. The 10 year old local company is on the cutting edge of efforts to promote private enterprise in space. Bigelow is about to invest in a major expansion that will mean up to 1,200 new jobs over the next year. George Knapp, the I team, got an exclusive look inside the Bigelow operation. You're here with an update. And of course, as you know, we've been in the plant a couple yes. of times and we had the only camera. Are present for its two space launches, but what's unfolding now is the most significant development since the company was launched. The dream of private enterprise in space is no longer a futuristic hope, it's here. Southern Nevada finds itself at the center of a brand new industry that will generate hundreds of good jobs and could literally change the world. More than a few doubts were raised back when the signs went up at Warp Drive and Skywalker Way, and again when Bob Bigelow spoke of hotels in space for the ultimate vacation. But after two successful launches of Bigelow's homegrown Genesis spacecraft, the aerospace industry isn't laughing anymore. We're bound to mess up or screw up a little bit of this or that. And now Bigelow is briskly moving into new territory. This 185,000 square foot addition to his plant in North Las Vegas represents the birth of a global industry right in our backyard. It's way beyond R&D. It's a production facility for spacecraft, a factory for building habitats for use on the moon or Mars or beyond. The only purpose this addition has is for production. And we have three spacecraft, so we essentially will have three production lines, an assembly, you know, like an assembly plant you would normally have. Bigelow expects the plant to be open for business by this time next year. It means his lean workforce of 115 would expand by an additional 1,200 new positions, engineers, technicians, and support staff. It is exactly the kind of economic diversification Nevada leaders say they yearn for. We kind of keep a little quiet and it has huge potential. In more ways than one. Starting just over 10 years ago, Bigelow committed 500 million of his own dollars. He licensed a canceled NASA project called TransHab, added 14 or so of his own patents, and created a much improved expandable habitat that essentially means more space in space. One was launched in 2006, another in 2007, and they're still up there. And both vehicles have been uh, performing flawlessly in terms of their pressure maintenance, their thermal control, uh, as well as their environmental containment scenarios. So we're, we're real pleased with the performance. So pleased the company skipped right over an interim craft to go for the gusto. Three different designs that each offer much more than the cramped modules that make up the International Space Station. This would be three times the volume as the average module on station, on ISS. So what is the plan? Would you have these up there by themselves or they would just be components of a, of a space station or a series of space stations? That could fly by itself. These are totally self-contained space, uh, habitable uh, spacecraft. The company has come so far so fast in part by keeping things simple, sometimes relying on off-the-shelf components. There are no technical barriers remaining. That are flight ready and qualified and ready to bolt on as soon as we're ready to have a structure to bolt it to. Bigelow uses these intricate models as part of the sales pitch to foreign governments or corporations, anyone interested in leasing one or more of the modules. Seven countries have already signed on, including the UK, Japan and Australia, meaning they can put their own astronauts into space without paying for an entire space program from scratch. But this is outfitted uh, 
to uh, support six people in the, in the living quarters and crew quarters are in this area. The plant also has full-scale mock-ups, and the biggest difference between these and what's up there now is elbow room. How important is that for a long-term mission? Just ask the Bigelow employee who's been to the ISS as the pilot of a space shuttle mission. It's nice to have privacy. You know, on the shuttle, yeah, we had a communal living all on the mid-deck. Um, Sometimes, you know, I spend a night on the space station just to get away, you know, <laughs> so this is the chance for everybody to get away when they want to, you know, spend, you know, for these long duration missions, you're going to have to have some personal time. So how much would it cost to lease one of the Bigelow modules? They have a very detailed price list and a sophisticated pitch about why a country or a company would want to boldly go to this new frontier. Tomorrow at 11, we'll talk about cost, in case you want to start saving your pennies <laughs> now. And we'll have a look at a new proposed moon base. And we'll be there tomorrow for the NASA announcement, which we think will give Bob Bigelow a piece of the International Space Station. So, um, Bigelow Aerospace is planning to launch modules into orbit between 2000 when this happens, um, there will be sort of space in space, um, space stations available that people can rent, people, corporations, governments can rent at a much lower rate than great than the International Space Station. Because, to be honest, as a service carrier technology, you get a lot more space for the mass that you're sticking up there. Now, I both think that most of us would agree that space is kind of cool and that many of us would like to sort of experience the zero G experience. However, um, one question that has to be answered is what actual practical use of space? And we're going to address that question this evening, but before we get into that, I just want to talk about the sort of fundamental difference between moving stuff in space <coughs> versus moving stuff in Earth. Um, so if you take a look here, I know it's a little bit faint, um, but you'll see the planets rotating around the sun, and it seems fairly intuitive to most people that if the planets weren't moving around, it just sort of fall in because the sun has gravity, right? Um, so, what also seems fairly intuitive to most people is that if you go from one of these inner rings, say, um, from Earth to Mars, um, you have to speed up your orbit, so you're actually moving faster around the sun, so your centrifugal force gets a little bit stronger and sort of goes out to compensate. Likewise, you need to slow down your orbit to go from an outer ring to inner ring. Um, so if you want to go from Mars to Earth, you can slow down your orbit and then spiral in and go to one of the inner rings, such as Earth's. And since there's no friction in space, it doesn't really matter which way you're going, either way you need to get sort of a kick. And we call the magnitude of this kick um, delta V, which just stands for change in velocity. So now that we got that out of the way, let's move on. So um, just to give a relative idea of some of these different kicks and delta Vs that people are talking about, since it's the number one biggest criteria for how difficult the mission um, to get from where I'm standing to Earth orbit or the International Space Station takes a change in velocity of about 10 kilometers per second. Now the interesting thing is, once you're in that low Earth orbit, it only takes a change of about 6 kilometers per second to go to the orbit of Jupiter. So really it's one of these things where once you're in low Earth orbit, you're pretty much halfway in anywhere. Now to put that into perspective, a high velocity rifle bullet, such as the ones that M16s fire and stuff like that, moves out about a third a kilometer per second. So we're talking really, really fast here. So um, now that we're all on the same page with that, let's talk about how and why space can be important. SpaceX is important to space endeavors because the single most biggest factor for making things hard is the expense of getting stuff up there. However, once you get your people and equipment up there, you'd actually need some sort of space for them to be able to live and breathe and actually do stuff up there, at least if you're using the people. So that's why big low aerospace is important. So the big question as far as whether space is useful or whether we're just wasting the money comes down to once you have people and equipment in space, is there anything useful that they can do up there? And as it turns out, there's actually a lot you can do up there. We're going to start by talking about mining. Planetary resources is a very recent entry as far as commercial space. There were some rumors about them about eight months back and bring some big names on their investor lists like Larry Page and James Cameron. Um, Larry Page is one of the co-founders of Google, and uh, James Cameron in the Avatar movie and the Alien movie, all the big films. Um, however, in April, they made their big debut by doing a press release, um, and they also made that video I showed at the beginning. 
Um, so, what they're talking about is the fact that there's 9,000 asteroids that come really close to Earth at some point in their ass in their orbit. Um, it's actually a lot easier in terms of the delta V thing that we were talking about before to get material from these asteroids to Earth orbit than it is to even get materials from the Moon. And much, much easier than to get the materials from Earth because you don't have to fight against nearly so much gravity. And um, also, since the asteroids don't have any atmosphere or no gravity, you can use low thrust technologies like uh, ion drives and solar sails, which if you tried to use on Earth, they'd never get off the ground. But in space, they can just sort of slowly tug for a very long period of time. So, um, so though, what's worthwhile about this stuff? Well, recall that to get one of these bottles of water to the International Space Station with the shuttle costs about $19,800. And even with the Falcon Heavy Booster up, running, and working, it still costs about two grand to get one of these bottles of water. Um, however, many asteroids have water, CO2, methane, and metals in them. And if you could actually get some water from one of those asteroids and return it to lower Earth orbit, you wouldn't have to lift it, so it would actually be worth a fair amount of money. Um, other things that you can do with water, it's very useful stuff, is um, electrolyze it to form hydrogen and oxygen which you can use to actually drive normal chemical uh, hydrogen oxygen markets. And also, it turns out that if you focus on sunlight, steam actually makes remarkably good rocket. Um, and in addition, you can drink this stuff. Um, so many asteroid mining plans actually sort of hedge on this fact that you can use the water fuel. And what they do is they send out a very small spacecraft which collects about a bunch of water and then uses about half that water to get the rest of the material that they want back. In addition, if you're going in mining asteroids, you can bring back metals, which might be useful if you just left them in orbit to build stuff like antennas or uh, additional sort of space stations. So, well and good. You can use stuff in space to make more stuff in space. Well, it still kind of sounds like we're just throwing away money in space. However, there's a few other things you can do. Did I mention that there's unlimited energy in space? Um, the sun shines up there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There isn't any weather, there isn't any real estate, there isn't any gravity. Um, just, stuff just sort of sits there and you can build a solar farm as large as you want and beam the power back to Earth. So potentially, if we actually went out there and started building stuff, we could actually solve the energy crisis just by building a lot of these solar cell stations in space. Um, in addition, you could actually replace a lot of the coal station on Earth, which would markedly reduce our greenhouse emissions, because everyone knows how nasty coal is and how much smoke and stuff it sticks up. The same technology could also be used to build very large and inexpensive desalinization plants. Um, so basically, if we went out in space in a big way and started building stuff there, we could get cheap power and clean water, not just to America, but to the entire world. So um, before I move on, any questions? There's a mic right there. No? Okay. Well then, we'll keep going. Um, continuing on, did you know how many asteroids have large amounts of metals? Um, somewhere in the audience here, you should find two meteorite fragments, which are passing around right there. If anyone else wants to take a look at a fragment of a meteorite and see the nice shiny stainless steel all together, um, take a look right there um, and snag it from the uh, gentle lady. <laughs> okay, so about these asteroids. Some of them, as um, planetary resources mentioned, have more platinum than mankind has mined in the entire history of mankind. Um, Planetary Resources likes this because if they can go and get the platinum and bring it back, that's worth an awful lot of money. Um, in addition, there's some more sort of pragmatic things. Asteroids are in many ways like a busted up planet, and if you recall, Earth has a sort of molten iron core, which means that th there's thousands and thousands of asteroids flying out there that are basically these gigantic floating hunks of stainless steel, kind of like the meteorite fragments back there in the back. Um, so basically, if we could actually get out and safely retrieve the material from these asteroids and aerobrick it back to Earth, then potentially we could vastly increase the resource base of Earth and get rid of one of the most smelly, energy-intensive, sort of nasty polluting processes on Earth, namely metal smelting. Um, if we could bring back enough material, then you could do that. 
In addition, useful stuff you can do in space. Um, science. Did you know that's incredibly hard to get good vacuum on Earth? You need really expensive vacuum pumps, you need steel containment vessels. Basically, it's a huge pain in the butt. Whereas, even when you get all this equipment, you don't even have as good vacuum as you can just get by walking outside the space station or the space station. Sorry. Um, in addition, it's not hard to get cryogenic temperatures on there. You need to get stuff like liquid nitrogen or liquid helium. In space, you can just stick something in the shade and wait a few hours and voila, cryogenic temperatures. It's kind of inconvenient when you're in a spacesuit, but as far as industrial processes, it's really kind of nifty. Now, um, so I hope we've established that there's at least some practical benefits for going out there into space. There are more, but before I go into them, let's talk about some of the difficulties and methods of actually you know, manufacturing stuff. Um, so what's been said about the dangers of space? And low, once you get past low Earth orbit, there's a lot of radiation, especially in the Van Allen Belt. Um, there's always vacuum, and you have to make or bring your own air. In addition, if something goes wrong, in general, you're completely on your own. Now, that may change in the future, but for now, it's sort of a no one can hear you scream in space type thing. <laughs> However, there's definitely some pluses. Um, in space, you can have access to as much heat as you want. If you want to smelt a bunch of steel, you don't have to mine and burn a bunch of coal. Instead, you can just take a few pounds, sorry, a few pounds of aluminized mylar and make it a really big meter. Um, now, if you're unfamiliar with aluminized mylar, it's this stuff right here. So, this package weighs under an ounce, and inside this package, if you unfold it, you get a mirror about this big. Basically, because there's no gravity in space, if you leave something just sort of sitting in space, it stays there. You can use a little tiny wire to put it in whatever position you want. Now, a piece of an aluminized mylar this big has a flat mirror would actually give you about 3.82 kilowatts of heat energy. Now, to put this in perspective, the average household is used for heating the entire house 1.4 kilowatts of heat energy. Basically, you can take in space, a few pounds of this stuff, make a really big mirror, and presto, you can melt steel because you can just pile on the solar light and get more and more and more because this stuff is just so thin, so cheap, and in space, you don't have to hold it up or anything. You just stick it out there. And also in space, the sun never gets cloudy, there's never night, it's just always shining. Um, likewise, you can take this same film here and put something in shadow to really cool it down. You can even liquefy gases this way, where you can just take the gas, stick it in shade, and then the natural sort of temperature of space is about 3 degrees Kelvin. So you can make liquid nitrogen and all sorts of other things just by sticking it in the shade. Now, the fact that you have a really good vacuum means that you can also do some stuff that takes really special equipment on Earth. Um, a good example of this is vapor deposition. Um, now, vapor deposition might sound a little bit scary, but basically what it means is you just vaporize something and then have it condense and stick to something else. Um, so, for example, if you took a tea kettle and heated up a bunch of water, got steam, and then had the steam condense on something like a beaker with, with, with liquid nitrogen in it and turned the ice on the outside, that would be vapor deposition. Now, normally what people are talking about is vaporizing metal and then having it stick to something. Like, if you take a look at this aluminized mylar here, this is a plastic film with a very, very thin coating of metal on it. Um, this wasn't actually done by vapor deposition, but it could have been. Um, basically, what you do is you heat up the metal really, really hot, and you have to get in a really good vacuum, because otherwise the metal vapor will react with the air and sort of oxidize. But in space, you can just sit out your little sheet of plastic, and then sort of float a piece of metal over it and hit it with a bunch of sunlight, the metal vaporizes and all of a sudden your plastic is shiny. 
In fact, you can go much, much further with this. You can actually keep on vaporizing the material and take something like this really thin mylar and actually transform it into sheet metal by just continuing to add metal vapor onto it. Because as far as a metal vapor is concerned, this stuff, even at room temperature, is really, really cold. Six. Um, you can also liquefy the metal, since melting is very easy, and get small droplets, which is actually more similar to how this is actually done, the metallization process here. Once that film has turned into a thin sheet, what you can do is make a cylinder out of it and spin it around and then melt metal and stick it on the inside, which actually turns it into a fairly thick pipe, which is very similar to how they do cast iron pipe on Earth, if any of you have ever seen that process. Um, the same ease of vapor deposition can also be useful for other things. Um, basically, it's quite possible, but we need to do a little bit more research into this, that it would be possible to make thin film solar cells using physical vapor deposition, which means, potentially, that you can send out very small amounts of material and being able to make very large amounts of solar cells, which would be great for these solar power satellites and also mean that electric energy in space is really, really cheap. Now, um, other benefits. The fact that you have vacuum and zero gravity in space enables containerless processing of material. It sounds very fancy, but the simple fact of the matter is when you're trying to make really pure alloys on Earth, you have to hold that molten metal in something. And in general, the container that you're holding the molten metal with tends to react and sort of contaminate your stuff. So in space, you can just sit the metal floating in the middle of the vacuum and then zap it and do whatever you want to with it. And because you have nothing touching it, there's no contamination, so you can make really nice, really pure metallic alloys. And also, grow some very large crystals, because you can get very high purity without any gravity. Oops. <laughs> now, another benefit is that you can build, move and build really large things. And something is bigger than what can be fit into truck or rail car on Earth, you have to break it apart before trying to fly it out and move it somewhere. In space, you can build an entire space station and then just push on it for a while until it changes orbit and it's moved. You can make entire cities, potentially, and just shove them from one orbit to another one. But let's talk about how you can get that push that you need to actually build the stuff. So, um, to do big space, stuff in space, you need transportation infrastructure. Now the trick with rockets is, to get sort of a linear increase in the amount of delta V that they can deliver to something, you need an exponentially bigger rocket. So once you get past a certain delta V change, it gets to be that actually doing it with the rocket is fairly ridiculous and you need a ridiculous amount of mass. Like we're at the bare limits of what's possible getting stuff from Earth to orbit. Um, you get much further past uh, 10 kilometers per second and it just will not happen with a chemical rocket. However, there's some other stuff that would, could be used. Um, so you could get around this by using some of the resources that you find out there, like for instance the asteroid mining um, example that I talked about, where you could take some of the water and then you move the asteroid material using that water. But the problem is you're burning off all the mass doing it that way. Now, Despite the popular image of space being intimately tied to the rocket, there are some other better candidates for sort of the um, tugboats and tankers of the cosmos. So, solar sails have recently come to some prominence uh, following the uh, Japanese Icarus mission, or sorry, Icarus mission. Um, solar sails, such as the Icarus mission depicted here, function by reflecting light from the sun to create a very gentle thrust. Since the light has energy, it also has mass, and of course, moves at the speed of light. Um, so what you can do is you can slow down your orbit around the sun by shining the light in the direction that you're moving so that it sort of kicks you back in the opposite direction and slows down your orbit. And likewise, you can speed up your orbit by sort of moving the sunlight in the opposite direction of how you're moving, which kicks you the other way. Now, you don't get much thrust from solar sails like this. Like it's a very, very small amount, but the thing is you can keep on getting it. So over the course of several years, or even just one or two years, this builds up to a very, very large delta V, and you can just keep pushing. So with solar sails, there are no missions that you can't do in space. There's just missions that might take a very long time. So 
So we're going to look like this. And sorry, if this idea seems far back to you, um, please look up the Japanese JAXA Icarus, or Icarus mission. Um, it actually passed by Venus on December 8, 2010. So this stuff works. <laughs> Now, um, sails like this work better the thinner they are because you can get more reflective area and reflect more sunlight for a given amount of material the thinner the sail is. However, there's a very strong limitation on how thin the sails can be right now because they have to be folded up and stuck in the rocket. Now, if you can get around this by manufacturing the sails in space or by somehow getting around the folding problem, you can actually make much, much better solar sails that, in my opinion, would be the best thing possible to move stuff around once you get past solar orbit and there's no atmosphere. So, aluminum ore can be found on the moon, and just for kicks and giggles, let's see what you could do if you stuck a aluminum foil factory on the moon and just kicked out a bunch of household aluminum foil and turned it into solar sails. So it can actually be remarkably hard to find out how much foil an aluminum foil factory makes. Um, but I'm just gonna use one figure I've got in which a Chinese company with 210 employees makes 30,000 tons of aluminum of foil material per year. Now remember, household aluminum foil is actually ridiculously thick for a solar sail, so it makes sort of a disgracefully inefficient solar sail, but we know that we can make aluminum foil. There's no trick to it. You guys have played with the material, I'm sure, quite a bit in the course of your life. Um, you're at least very, very familiar with it. Um, so using household aluminum foil on the moon, if you take all 30 tons and turn it into household aluminum foil, um, that 30 tons of foil in the form of the solar sail would generate a sustained 2,039 newtons of thrust, just going one way or another in your orbit. With that thrust, sorry, thrust pushing on your asteroid for five years, you could generate enough delta B to actually return 130,000 tons of asteroid material. Now, to put that in perspective, your sail weighs 30,000 tons, and you're returning about four times that mass, a little bit more. So, now I've said that there's better solar sails that can be made, and we've demonstrated that you can actually do some very cool stuff just using tin foil, if you can actually make tin foil out there from lunar materials. But there's much, much better sails that can be made. Also, another figure to put that in perspective, that's about, um, Five times the mass of the International, triple the mass of the International Space Station, um, that material that you could return. Now, with these better solar sails, which are basically thinner solar sails, um, let's see what you could do if you use a 100 nanometer film, which is actually 10 times thicker than the thinnest possible that you could use. Um, just using the way the film to keep it simple, you would actually return um, 25 million tons of material. So that's about the mass of 57,000 international space stations. So basically, once we actually build these sails, oh yeah, and th these sails can keep on pushing year after year after year, and in the meantime, we would have produced another four sails while it was pushing so. So basically, if we get out there and we build some of the space infrastructure with a bunch of solar sails, it becomes a lot easier to sort of pick up stuff and move it around, moving resources from out in the asteroid belt or near the asteroids to Earth orbit and people in equipment now. Um, another fun fact, those same solar sails, the thinner ones, could actually do a three-week Mars mission as far as the delta that they can do. Um, so pretty cool stuff if we can pull it off. So um, you can get stuff, you can move stuff using these solar sails. So there's a few other things that you might want to build in space. A uh, concept that was developed in the 1970s was called the O'Neill colony. Um, the question addressed was basically, what if you actually just wanted to live in free space? Like, not, no planet, no moon, no nothing, just live out there. So, um, Gerald O'Neill and his colonies went through the difficulties of settling and living in free space one by one and overcame, overcame them. Now, the proposed um, structure was something like this.
the basic idea is that you take a really big structure and you spin it so that you get gravity on the inside from the centrifugal force. Um, and then you can recycle the air that's inside it. Um, now, some limitations for actually building these things. Um, you, since you're spinning it, there's forces that it has to resist, otherwise it'll sort of get pulled apart. Um, so the main limitation on how big you can build these structures is how much semi-wave gravity you want, how thick you want your radiation shielding to be. Most people like a little bit of radiation shielding in space. Um, and also, um, how thick you want, or how strong your materials are. Now, with full Earth semi-wave gravity, just as strong as it is right here, um, dirt shielding about 10 feet deep, which gives you a background radiation level about the same as you get on the Earth's surface, and uh, normal materials such as aluminum and steel for construction, um, you get a diameter of about a mile and a resulting land area of about the size of the county. Um, now, we don't honestly know how much gravity mankind actually needs. Um, no one has actually stayed in orbit long enough to see whether the sort of bone density loss that people get sort of plateaus, whether it sort of levels off when people get used to it. Um, so my bet would be that we need some, not necessarily a full lot of gravity, but at least some. But the interesting thing is, if you reduce the amount of simulated gravity in these structures, your structure can get correspondingly larger. Um, now, even if you didn't reduce the amount of gravity, what you can do is build a bunch of these um, stations within a few hundred miles of each other, and then basically set up a taxi service so that you can move back and forth between them um, to make whatever size of you want. Now, one of the interesting things um, is that each of these structures are sort of their own little world, and it has an airlock between it and everything else, which implies a few different things. First off, recycling is going to be rather important. All the food eaten in the station needs to be either grown there or possibly purchased from another station with the associated waste being returned. Um, plants are used both for food and to scrub CO2 from the air and other waste gas. Um, however, electrical energy would be rather abundant because you have easy access to solar cells, sorry, solar cells, and uh, you can make these solar cells using those industrial processes and resources that I've talked before. Now, I doubt you'll ever see internal combustion engine anywhere outside the classroom because, to be honest, who wants to make smoke in a very small sort of bubble? Um, now, it would be possible for each person coming in and out of these stations to undergo a very thorough physical so that it might be possible just by simple quarantine, not letting in sick people until they get better, you could eliminate a lot of common sort of irritants that people have to put up with on Earth, such as the common cold. Um, just imagine a place where nasal infections and the common cold just didn't exist um, because people had to see the doctor before they came in. <laughs> um, so there's many desirable features about living in such a world. They range from somewhat tri trivial, such as being able to strap on wings and fly in a little gravity environment which is kind of far out, but actually quite physically possible if you have one of these things. Um, to control the weather and move from season to season with the equivalent of driving about 30 minutes, basically you just move from one habitat which has a tropical season in it to another habitat which has a winter season in it. So it's very straightforward. You can go skiing and then surfing if you really want it. Um, so to, there's also more profound benefits, like the fact that you have to balance your the nature inside each one of these stations so much that you can actually run for thousands of years and possibly as long as the sun's around. Um, some people would probably like it for the political freedom, as each little world, like I said before, could move from one orbit to another one. So if they didn't like their neighbors, they could just up and leave. Um, <laughs> so imagine if your each little county in the United States could just leave and go somewhere else in the United States. If they didn't like <laughs> um, some people would probably like it for the security, knowing that each structure, each one of these structures, would actually be really, really hard to invade and capture and tap. Um, for the most part, though, I think people will go because they'll have cheap access to those industrial processes that, that I was talking about, which means, for the most part, that they'll have a much higher standard of living than people on Earth. Now, would you move to a city on the other side of the world if it would pay you 10 times as much for the same work that you're doing here? Um, 
basically the price of goods and services ultimately rests on the amount of labor that has to go into them and the scarcity of the resources that they're made from. So once there's serious industrial facilities in space, the labor cost of manufacturing stuff will be much lower on Earth and materials much more readily available. So if it's established that at least some people would find living in space desirable, the next logical question would be um, how many of these little worlds that you can build. Um, so before we move on, uh, raise your hand who might at least think about the possibility of moving to space if there are stations like the one that you saw. Okay, awesome. So it seems like at least a few people would find this desirable, especially if they're making lots of money. Um, <laughs> so the question is how many of these little worlds, um, worlds like that one, could we build? Um, and the answer is you could build the equivalent of about a thousand Earths just from the main belt asteroid material. Which is kind of weird because if you add up all of the mass from the main belt asteroids, it only comes out to about 5% of the mass of the moon. Which seems like kind of a weird disconnect. You just sort of shoved everything together to get this little potato way smaller than the moon. But instead, I'm saying that you can get this huge 100 Earth uh, land masses, or sorry, 1,000 Earth land masses. Um, and the sort of math behind that actually comes out to how disgracefully inefficient planets are for using the material that they have. And I'll get into that in just a sec. So basically, the reason why you can make the, so many open neo colonies for this is the fact that it takes a pyramid from here to about the radius of the Earth, which I believe is approximately 6,371 kilometers. And for those of you that don't really like metric, that's three. 1,958 miles. So to support me and to make an Earth-like surface, we have to take a pyramid about yay big by yay big and have it go down for 3,958 miles, which is kind of a big pyramid. Um, to talk about the amount of dirt that that would take, um, it's something like, sorry, 1,748 semi-trailer trucks um, full of dirt, just to make that one square foot that I'm standing on. So if you guys are at all familiar with semi-trailer trucks, that's a lot of dirt. <laughs> that's a very, very large amount of dirt. <laughs> now, um, if you're building a meal, you need dirt, a uh, sort of rectangular thing of dirt about 10 feet deep, and that'd be the end of it. So if you were taking the same mass that the Earth has and turning it into O'Neill's, you could actually get, surface area equivalent-wise, about 700,000 O'Neill's, um, Earth equivalents of O'Neill's. So alas, there's not quite that much material floating out there in the main belt. We could try messing with moons, but just using the main belt asteroids, we could build 1,000 Earths. So, they say there's just one planet, or only one Earth, but potentially there is much, much more if we actually do out of there. So, um, by bringing industrialization to space, we will not merely be laying claim to some small and desolate wasteland, but rather literally building new and possibly better worlds for ourselves and our children. Um, so, what needs to happen to bring such a dream to reality? As I said, it is vitally important that people and equipment be brought into space with the intention to actually build there, rather than just sort of look around and explore. Actually build things out there. Um, the important step is to get people and machines up there to just go and sort of live. Um, so, I talked about where the space industry seems to be headed and what should be possible once more people and equipment get out there um, with the intent to actually build and make money. Um, so the last thing to cover before I bring this talk to a close is how you can get involved and why you might want to. So, I'm not going to ask you to write your congressman and talk about how much you support the space program and how important space is to you. To be honest, I don't actually think that that would accomplish all that much. Um, however, there's a lot of small research projects that would be enormously helpful for actually building things in space and might develop into full-fledged space community companies. For instance, no one has ever actually constructed and tested a miniature biosphere capable of supporting manuals. They've tested bits and pieces, but never really put the whole thing together successfully. If any of you guys have heard of Biosphere 2, it came kind of close, but they had this weird flaw where the concrete and 
the building that they made actually started absorbing their CO2, which meant whenever their oxygen turned in, got eaten and turned into CO2, the CO2 would go into the concrete, and then all of a sudden they didn't have any oxygen, which wasn't exactly a desirable situation. Um, so, I personally favor starting small and sort of building up. A worthwhile project would be to design, likely with some sort of robotic system, a system capable of sustaining one lab mouse for the duration of its natural life. Now, if you wanted to sort of cheat and do this, what you could do is just have a really big food container and then a really big air scrubber. But that's not really the point of this sort of thing. Um, basically, what you'd want to do is identify what plants the mouse would need to actually survive and what it wants to eat. And then have a way where you can take the waste of the mouse and actually turn it back into food so that everything stays in balance. Um, for those of you concerned with animal rights, let me reassure you that the CO2 monitor in the chamber with the mouse and if the CO2 got too high or the oxygen got too low, you let the mouse out. Just for those of you concerned about suffocating mice. <laughs> um, so, why this would be important is that such an experiment would sort of confirm that yes, we actually can build closed ecosystems and it would provide a logical sort of progression forward where you can sort of start small and then go with larger and larger mammals and larger and larger things until you're actually supporting people. The other thing is you could try several different ways of making a closed ecology with more or less robots or more or less diversity to see what works. It wouldn't cost that much and it's the sort of thing that students could do with or without official support because we're talking about something that should be about tabletop size. Um, so I have a lot more projects like the one that I just talked about listed on the website associated with this talk. Um, just in case you're curious later, that's projectnewatlantis.org. It's a wiki, so whoever wants to can go and edit and add things. Um, so there's also some things for people that want a little bit more hands-on with the orbital stuff. Um, introducing CubeSats. I don't know if all of you have heard of them. Basically, um, things have come a long way. So for $6,000, a person can get a kit to build a CubeSat, and for $60,000, they can actually put it into orbit. So here's an eighth grader that built one. In 2007, China destroyed a satellite with a missile. This now makes all satellites vulnerable to attack. A solution to this problem would to be separate one large satellite into several smaller satellites that still have the same function as the original one. One way to do this would be through CubeSats. A CubeSat is a small, lightweight satellite that is 10 centimeters cubed and weighs under 1 kilogram. They were originally developed by Cal Poly University to teach university and college students about aerospace technology. There's a lot of information on the internet about these and I became interested in building my own. My CubeSat tracks its position, altitude, and speed and transmits it out and also transmits video. Each function's components on individual removable cards which makes the entire system modular. The first card is a Parallax Basic Stamp Microcontroller, which had to be modified to fit in the frame and I had to learn PBasic, which is the programming language for this microcontroller. I then developed my own program to individually turn all the individual devices on and off on command. The next card is the Tracker card. On one side is the APRS card and on the other side is the GPS receiver. The GPS gathers the data and sends it to the terminal node controller, which converts the raw GPS, GPS data into an APRS data stream and transmits it out on VHF on this antenna. The next card is the amateur television card, which simply takes the video from an onboard camera and transmits it out on UHF on this antenna. On the bottom is the power distribution board, which I had to design and build from scratch. I got a blank board from Radio Shack and designed it to take the power from an 11.1 volt polymer lithium ion battery and distribute it to all the different components in the satellite. The frame, I got the CAD files online from a company called PumpkinSat and submitted them to Rapid Technology in Honolulu. They then printed out an exact replica of the frame out of plaster dust and epoxy. And now I'd like to turn it on for you. And here is the live video. I believe that the future of the satellite industry is in small distributed satellites that are cheap and easily made. Thank you. Okay, so that freezes there, so hopefully no one will be freaked out by the freezing staff. Okay, so basically, one of these satellites can be launched. It's about a kilogram, which is again about the mass of this water bottle. Um, and there's a lot of interesting things you can do, not just 
sending back video, but you can also um, possibly do solar sails and ion drives because they function more or less independent of scale. Um, and several university departments have launched stuff like this. Um, it's actually well known the famous feasibility to do it. Um, so potentially some people might work with that. Um, so if you deploy a small solar cell on one of these things and actually get it past geosynchronous orbit, so it's away from the atmosphere, further than orbit orbit, then potentially that sail, if you could maintain communication with the uh, CubeSat, would actually be able to go past Venus as well. Um, solar sails will get something there eventually if we keep on pushing along and off. Um, so one interesting project might be to try and figure out the sort of optimal transmitter receiver pairs so that we can make the smallest missions possible um, just to sort of get things out there and do things with them. Okay, so in 4 dm um, lastly there's a lot of large amount of mundane work that needs to be done on the best way to sort of grow economy in isolation. Um, it'd be beneficial to develop CAD formats and machine designs that would allow automatic managing of dependencies, like those that exist in any software systems. If such a system were developed, you'd basically be able to say, okay, I have these machine tools. Can I make this particular part? And your software would be able to say, no, you can't, or yes, you can, this is how you do it. Um, so this would be really, really handy if we could make that happen. Um, on a less abstract level, there's a lot of work to be done on automatic machine tools. For those of you not familiar with machine tools, um, they're used to cut metal in very precise shapes, and they're how we make most of our sort of custom, um, sophisticated machinery, such as cars. Um, and there's a few different types, but the biggest thing is we put a lot of work into being able to just stick material into one, um, just clamp it in there, and then have the program run and it'll spit out metal in a very uh, precise shape. However, a lot less work has been done into how to actually load and unload them one of these things if there's not a human around. Now, we live in an age of very sophisticated robotics, so I'd like to show you a visualization of something that NASA's been thinking about working on. Services. 
Um, I would not be surprised at all if there are many, many new space billionaires in the next 10 to 30 years. In the end, though, I think what it comes down to is the world that you prefer to live in. Do you really want to live in a world of constraints, economic stagnation, and potential eco-doom scenarios? Or would you prefer to get to work, help solve the energy crisis, and potentially build, potentially and personally build a much better world for you and your children? So thank you. Um, this is going to sort of merge over into interest me for a possible commercial space club here at State. I've lined up five faculty sponsors if you're interested. We'd be getting speakers from some of these companies and also potentially working on some of the research projects that I talked about. So thank you.